Another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast, and we're here with, of course, the weekly news um, because we know that because we've got Nick Bendel here right in front of us. And Nick, you're the one that brings us the news. I am always delighted to join you for the weekly news, Owen. I regularly dial in from Sydney. Sometimes I'm in different parts of the country. I am in Sydney today. What about you? Oh, yes. Well, um, yeah, for a change, usually you're the one jet setting and enjoying yourself all over the place. But um, yes, uh, today I'm in the the uh, gorgeous sunny coast of um, Queensland. So uh, just a short break, but um, always dedicated to the job, the job of being on the podcast with you, Nick. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. I love the Sunshine Coast. It's such a beautiful part of Australia. Yes, and perfect temperature today, low 20s, possibly a little bit of rain, but just enough to keep the streets clean. Okay, well, I'm I'm glad (laughs) you're concerned about the streets. That is good. We all need clean streets. We do. I'm going to preempt your next question, which is, what have I been up to over the past week? Yes, how did you know I was going to ask you that? I'm psychic, and I decided to ask myself the question this week. I own a copywriting agency called Hunter and Scribe. We write content for finance and property professionals. And one of the things we help our clients with is attaining media coverage. And last week, I I mentioned that I gave a presentation to a financial planning dealer group about how to attain media coverage. Mm. The presentation went really well, and I received this testimonial from the organizers. The session Nick presented was unlike anything our advisors have enjoyed before, and many called or emailed me to confirm this delight after the event. In a webinar full of practical ideas and exciting action steps to be followed, Nick certainly made a difference, and thanks to his wonderful contribution, I know some of our advisors will be able to take their marketing, social media, and broader business profile to the next level. Great. Well done, Nick. Well, thank you. I I was very grateful for those kind words from the organiser. Yes, and um, you're quite often presenting at um, many of um, uh, these groups or um, uh, conferences, so um, you you must be getting good at it. Well, I I do like to present. I am a bit of an attention seeker, so it's so nice when everyone's looking at me. But it's funny, I, I have a bit of a pet hate in terms of conferences and events because and, and I hope this doesn't sound like I'm being a little bit bitchy, but a lot of speakers, they don't offer any real information. Their speeches aren't coherent. They don't seem to have rehearsed at all. They seem to go all over the place. So when I speak, I like to make sure that it's really informative, coherent, easy to follow, and that there's always some practical advice that people can go and implement. Hopefully, I, I was able to achieve that with that last presentation to those financial advisors. Yes, well, just like you do here, you you turn up, you're organised, you're prepared, and um, you add a lot of value. So um, thank you, Nick. Well, thank you, Owen, for your kind words. What have you and Leafield been up to over the past week? Well, being a short week last week with a public holiday, um, we had lots to do. So, um, yes, cramming it all in. And, um, yes, we're um, busy as usual with new managements, new business partners coming on, and um, more of the same for us. Were you able to get everything done that you wanted to get done last week? No. Okay, well, then I was about to say, if so... Are you promoting a four-day work week? But it sounds like the answer to those two questions is no and no. No and no, yes. Um, but it didn't help. Yeah, we had uh, a couple of staff members um, um, unwell as well. So, um, you yeah, know, it, it made a short week even um, even shorter. So, um, but that that's life and that's um, that's business. So uh, we, we got onto it um, and um, here we are. Here we are. And... Speaking of uh, things being slightly abbreviated, normally we have three news stories to discuss, but I thought this time we would have two news stories and really go deep on the second story, which I think people are going to find very interesting. Okay, well, looking forward to it. It's um, I did get a, a I had a brief look at the lineup, and yes, it's going to be an interesting conversation. 
Okay, well, let's start with the least interesting story then, uh, okay. which, which is foreign investor tax blamed for lower housing supply. Queenslanders have lost out on 33,000 new homes since the state government introduced a suite of taxes eight years ago, according to new research by the Queensland Economic by Queensland Economics Advocacy Solutions, which was commissioned by the Property Council of Australia. The report also found that total international investment had fallen 83.9% since the tax regime was introduced in 2016, resulting in the state losing out on an estimated $17.8 billion in housing investment. Now to quote Property Council Queensland Executive Director Jess Clare, these apartment killer taxes were sold to Queenslanders as a solution to a perceived influx of overseas buyers looking to crowd them out of housing. But in reality, they've put the handbrake on housing delivery altogether. These ill-considered taxes have only worsened Queensland's housing issues by driving away the global capital that backs Australian-based developers who deliver new homes at scale and bring community building projects to life. Owen, do you agree with the argument that foreign investor taxes hurt local buyers by reducing the construction of new supply and therefore putting upward pressure on prices? Or do foreign investor taxes actually protect local buyers by reducing competition from foreign buyers? Mm. Well, like most governments, they introduce taxes um, uh, from a political point of view, not not um, not from the, the point of view of actually trying to uh, get a positive result. Uh, the only positive result they're looking at is getting re-elected. And, um, and um, bashing on the uh, foreign investor, you know, uh, let's stop those foreigners at the border from taking all of our assets. Yes, it's something that, uh, um, you know, governments have been uh, doing of uh, recent years um, to be able to give the impression that they're doing something to help the little battler get into their home. So, um, but with most occurrences, when governments do this, they don't think about the uh, the the bigger picture. And um, foreign investors, even though they're such a small part of the market um, that is out there actually buying property, um, it's still a, a enough of a market um, to um, make make a dent, uh, especially when it comes to providing rental properties. Um, so uh, we can see in several areas uh, around the country that where this, these taxes have been introduced on foreign investors, um, we've seen a, a drop in stock in brand, mainly brand new units. Um, have, we've seen a, a, a drop in that sort of um, supply of rental properties. So uh, it, it does make a difference. So for the for the family who's looking at buying a you know a three or four bedroom house out in the burbs, it doesn't make a, a, a an ounce of difference at all. So, but for um, renters who need to live somewhere, and um, and as well as all of these um, foreign investors, uh, foreign students who have come into the market, um, uh, who have come here to be able to study. Um, and taken away properties from a lot of um, Aussies who have been trying to find a place to live, uh, it's um, uh, suddenly there's not a lot of properties. So yes, there is there is an issue there about um, um, uh, a lack of stock of rental properties. And uh, so I, I think it definitely has hurt the market. And um, Again, governments have just, um, they don't have the foresight. Um, you know, the only thing they're concerned about is getting re-elected. Yeah, the, I think that's an it's interesting point because if you're in government, whether state or federal, and if you can say, well, we're cracking down on foreign investors in order to help local buyers, that's a great soundbite. The only problem is it might actually worsen the problem, but then I guess it solves the problem of them being re-elected which is maybe the real problem they're trying to solve, as you mentioned. Yes, and um, when it comes to um, yeah, providing more supply, that even though it is a 
such a small amount of uh, of the broader bigger market um, if a certain development is um, and certain developers um, and developments within inner cities especially with large unit uh, unit blocks are contingent on getting these overseas investors to buy to be able to go forward and complete these um, these developments then yeah that's going to have a huge effect on the market so um, it's uh, it's in these smaller pockets of these uh, maybe larger unit block developments that rely on these foreign investors to be able to buy in um, yes I definitely agree there should be restrictions on foreign investment in in some aspects of um, of our economy uh, but when it comes to small residential investor investment uh, I, I don't think there's any issue right now as a general rule if you're a foreign buyer you're generally limited to new properties do you hmm. think uh, overseas buyers should be allowed to purchase existing property um, no, I, I, I think it's right to keep keep it restricted to, to new properties, um, especially in the with the larger um, unit developments. Um, it 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 suits our needs. It suits the developers' needs to be able to get a lot more sales in. Um, it's it's a win win for everyone. Um, yeah, there's there's no there's there's no benefit, and a lot of the overseas um, investors. Uh, looking at buying residential houses out in the burbs um, so yeah it's it's a, it's a good thing to be able to have them invest in the um, the high-rise units um, so yeah um, no issues there at all it's funny how week to week almost every story we discuss seems to come back to supply and demand and this is another example of that yeah it, it is like we, we we need more supply in the market and if um if foreign investors can help us um by getting uh developers to be able to uh, get those extra 20 percent in sales in those um in those high-rise uh, unit developments then I, I think that's a great thing well, let's move on to our second and final story where we're really going to dig deep on this one. REIV president calls for major rental reform. In an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald, Real Estate Institute of Victoria president Jacob Kane called for the introduction of residential leases that more closely resemble commercial leases with options for terms of 3, 5, 10, 15 and would get greater security and stability, while investors would get reduced vacancy and tenancy changeover costs. To quote Jacob Payne, renters would receive capped annual rent increases tied to the consumer price index and in recognition of their longer term commitment, could be offered rent free periods based on the length of their lease. In exchange, they would take on greater responsibility for the upkeep of the property fostering a sense of ownership and pride in their home throughout the lease term. For investment property owners, the government should provide index land tax discounts that increase with the length of the lease, creating a direct financial incentive for property investors to offer longer tenancies. Jacob Kane also said that if tenants terminated their lease early, they would have to keep paying rent until a replacement was found, or if an investor sold the property, the renter would be able to stay on under the new owner until their lease expired. So, Owen, let's really drill down into this one. So, firstly, one of the reasons Jacob Kane has called for this rental reform is because he says, quote, renters are wary of asking for longer term leases, fearing they will be discriminated against during the application process. Is he right? Um. <laughs> To a point, yes, but it's um, not as common as you might think. Um, it's yeah, we, we we very rarely get asked by tenants for for uh, even two year leases. Um, and um, and on the other side, owners 
very rarely ask for um, locking in a tenant for say up for a two year two year term. Um, so it's most common for a twelve month, and um, and even say a six month lease. So um, it's um, and it's quite common as well for people to just stay on a month to month periodic lease as well. Jacob Kane also says investors quote have been conditioned to be suspicious of offering longer leases out of fear of being tied to a poor quality renter, which happens exceptionally rare, rarely. Do you think he's right about that? Um, well, it, it does um, happen uh, rarely to, to get a poor quality tenant, um, but their pe people's lives change. And um, a lot of the time, um, people are wanting that flexibility in their lease terms um, as, a, as a tenant um, to be able to um, move when they want to. Um, they're happy to, to have a commitment for a, uh, a short period of time. Um, and usually 12 months um, would be enough and, and, and usually two years is enough. Um, but I, I think there's some merit in, in looking at the possibility, yes, as we are um, uh, moving as a society to um, having more uh, rental properties and people wanting more long-term stability. But um, yeah, so, something to consider. Just to share my personal experience with yeah, you. Yeah, sure. I, I remember when one of my leases was expiring a few years ago, I, I suggested to my property manager that we offer the tenant a five-year lease with rent increases occurring every 12 months. And I remember my property manager was shocked by this idea. She told me it was a bad idea and that I shouldn't offer the tenant more than two years. And I yeah. even kind of got the vibe that she thought even two years was excessive. What would you say if one of your investor clients suggested offering a five-year lease? Yes, so um, the um, the, the two-year term is definitely not often used and that's usually the maximum. Um, once you do go over a, a two-year term, certainly in New South Wales, um, where, I, where I know the legislation the best, um, it, it's, um, it does get deemed um, as a different type of lease. Um, so, it's, uh, so generally people don't go beyond the, a two-year term. Um, and yes, from, from both the owners and the um the renters point of view um generally they would both be fairly concerned about that because um what happens is is yeah there, there's there's an issue issue if they wanted to um sell the property as a as an owner with a long-term lease um even though you can have uh, automatic increases in rents locked in and agreed to at the at the beginning of the lease. Um, it's it's an issue if uh, if an owner needs to sell, um, and they would only be able to sell to a, a marketplace that is only a third of the whole marketplace. So they're they're missing out on on possibly two thirds of the marketplace being able to sell to. And um, because you would have to find an investor to take over the property um, as purely an investment. And, um, and then you've also got the possibility of, um, yes, your, your rent increases might be locked in, but um, the market could change quite dramatically in a two year period. And um, the, the, um, the rents could go up quite Quite dramatically and, and and a lot more than than what you were you're expecting um and so you might end up missing out on on further rental increases and um on the tenant side um yes they might be locked into um rental increases but the market might not increase as much as that. So so there'd be a hesitancy from the tenant's side to be able to do that for that reason as well. And 
the tenant might want to um, move and have that flexibility as well of um, being able to move a lot easier. And um, quite often it's hard to get um, tenants to even renew for a six or 12 month lease um, because they might be wanting to consider their options. So uh, um, it, it's um, uh, with, with the right options and clauses in place, uh, I think a, a five year option um could could be there um for all the right types of property that are built specifically for rental um and that would be you know not 90 percent of their their um purpose would be only for for um uh, rental properties um and and where the owner and the tenant agrees um that um it, it's 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 not something that gets asked for a lot. The the big concern my property manager had had was the thing What's you mentioned thing? a moment ago, which was what if the market rises higher than the built-in increase, which of course is a risk. But both parties, the landlord and the tenant, are taking a risk because what if the market yeah. doesn't rise as high as yeah and. It, it, there are no solutions in life. There are only trade-offs. Yes. And so what I suggested to the property manager was that we offer the tenant five options, a one-year option, a two-year option, a three-year option, a four-year option, a five-year option. <laughs> she she was appalled by this. And I think through gritted teeth, she said, well, we can do a one-year and a two-year if you, two if you want, Nick. And I'm a big believer in taking advice from experts. A professional property manager knows a lot more than me, so I went along with her suggestion. Um, very interested to hear your thoughts on that, Owen, so thank you for sharing. I, I also want to run something by you from Jacob Kane's article when he was talking about these long tenancies that could be five years or 10 or 20 years. Here's what he said, and I quote, renters would receive capped annual rent increases tied to the consumer price index and yep. in recognition of their longer term commitment, could be offered rent free periods based on the length of their lease. In exchange, they would take on greater responsibility for the upkeep of the property, fostering a sense of ownership and pride in their home throughout the lease term. Do you think that's a fair trade off? Um, long term, I, I think um, those suggestions are, are, are quite um, intelligent and um, and uh, something that would really change how uh, the tenant and owner uh, um, relationship would would um, would change. So it's um, yes, I, I I think that's it, I, I definitely think it's not a bad idea. Um, it's it's something uh, to consider because yes. Tenants do want, or some tenants do want more of an ownership of where they're living. Um, and, but then we start creating grey lines. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that, you know, we're hev heavily regulated already with legislation to, to have defined lines in place. So, um, the, the nature of a longer term lease, um, it would, um, would change the relationship and yes, uh, and those changes would, would have to be very well defined. So, and, and, uh, and that's probably why most tenants and most owners uh, do, do not um, entertain the option because they don't want those blurred lines. Mm. Let's look at it from the <clears throat> opposite perspective. Here's how Jacob Kane proposed that these long tenancies would work for investors. The government should provide index land tax discounts that increase with the length of the lease, creating a direct financial incentive for property owners to offer longer tenancies. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I, again, all, all very uh, intelligent and smart um, uh, suggestions. To be able to put it together as a package, to be able to offer it out there, um, it, it to to be able to um, 
put this into the marketplace and make it change, I think it would be more of a generational change that would have to happen. Um, you would have maybe one in a hundred properties that would probably take it up at, at, um, at the moment, um, if that even. Um, so it would be something that, um, it, because when we look at the average tenancy, we're probably looking at two to three years in general. So to have a tenant in a property for more than five years is a long time. Um, and, and that's why when, when you spoke to your property manager about your property and uh, you got that um, um, uh, concerned response, uh, it's um, yeah, it would be because yeah, it, it would be unlikely that that tenant would want to even stay there um, uh, for five years. Their intention might be to stay there for five years today, but people's lives change, um, and yeah, there, there's um, uh, very very few very few instances where tenants want to stay for more than than. Um, say three to five years. Well, well so what, what uh, kind, of, kind of the the overarching idea that I think motivated Jacob Kane to to write the article or, or at least to propose this idea is that it's become harder for people to buy their own home. Mm. And therefore, He's suggesting that we need to ditch the traditional Australian view that everyone should own their own home and adopt a European mindset where lifelong renting is regarded as normal. To quote Jacob Kane, long term renting needs to be recognised as a legitimate and respected choice, not yeah. a marker of failure or impermanence. Do you think we place too much emphasis on Australia in Australia on home ownership? Um, yes, uh, speaking to um, people from other parts of the world, um, it's we seem to be obsessed by the property market in Australia. It's um, it's a it's a we even call it ourselves as a national obsession uh, with the property market. So, and it's not just of recent times. It's been um, uh, been going around for um, it's been like that for a very long time. So it's, um, I, I think we do need to change the way we think about um, property ownership um, from it's, you know, it's, yes, the great Australian dream, it's the quarter acre block with the white picket fence. Um, but uh, is that a reality now? Um, probably not, certainly not the quarter acre block. Um, if, you, if you're able to, to buy a house now, you're probably looking at, on average, uh, 400 square metre block, um, which is 40% uh, of the quarter acre block. Um, so uh, things have um, reduced a bit, uh, except for the prices. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, So <clears throat> we can look at, um, um, yeah, other options as a, as a society and as a country of, of how to view property ownership and um, and how to view uh, renting. There's, there's still um, very much in the older population as well, older generations of a negative view of being a renter. And it's just like, well, uh, yeah, when are you going to buy something? It's just like, um, or um, yeah, you, you, you must be saving up or, or, or you're just not never going to be, you're going to be those one of the people that rent their whole lives. It's yeah, that, that shouldn't be a negative stigma anymore well in, in that case if we are going to change our mindset around this and normalize the idea of lifelong renting don't we need to put uh, protections in place or, or some sort of regime in place that can allow tenants to stay in the one property for many years without worrying about being kicked out um yes well well they they Already has been a lot of um, legislation changes to be able to make it harder for landlords to kick tenants out for just any reason. Um, and um, there's legislation being proposed at the moment in, in uh, legislation changes being proposed at the moment in New South Wales um, to do just that. 
I think we spoke about that a few weeks ago. Um, and um, it, and that'll make it um, uh, th that's supposed to give tenants some more comfort that uh, if um, they want to stay in the property for longer, um, you know, they can't just be kicked out willy nilly and for, for any reason at all. There needs to be a good reason for 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 the owner to take the property back. So it's um, they that that's called that no grounds evictions. Um, so uh, there's there's certainly those changes, but it, but in terms of giving people longer term security as 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 to what you, we're talking about now, um, I, I I think there's a possible case for it, um, but whether the marketplace on both sides of the coin um, is willing to accept it or entertain it is another thing. Um, so it's um, because people still want that flexibility as well at the same time. Mm. Well, well, as a result of our chat, I think when the lease that I uh, was referring to for, for that property I was referring to early, earlier, when that next expires, I think I'll suggest to my property manager that we offer a 20 year lease and uh, see how she replies. <laughs> um, yes, e e even in commercial leases, um, Nick, um, 20 years is um, considered to be a long time. Um, so um, good luck with that one. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Uh, this was a really interesting chat, Owen, and, and thank you for sharing your, your expert insights, which I always appreciate. Yes, well, I aim to provide value, so I hope that helps. And um, and and of course, this is all from from our experience as as a as a property management business. And um, yeah, we're dealing with owners and and tenants uh, every day, talking to them about all of the different options out there. And um, yeah, it's just something that um, yeah it doesn't come up too often, uh, but. With markets changing and and evolving, um, yeah, we need to look at all options at at at, uh, at different times. You're on the Sunshine Coast at the moment, as we said earlier. When we have our next podcast, where will you be? I will be back in uh, Sydney town. Okay. Well, until then. Yes. Until then, I'll see you there. Thanks.